Um, and the third possibility is that the damaged region tends to be injured when the region responsible for the behavior is injured, for example, because they're near each other. Um, so this often causes problems because strokes especially are, are, tend to be large. Um, I shouldn't say it's not, not that they're all large, um, but the patients who, who, who end up in, in a lot of these studies um, frequently have large strokes, and uh, the, um, the distribution of the strokes is not only non-random because of, because of the um, vasculature, but it's also non-random because um, you know, we, we tend to look at you know, tiny little one by one by one millimeter voxels, and um, the typical uh, area of, uh, you know, of infarct may, be, <coughs> may have you know, 10, 20, 30,000 such voxels. Um, so uh, certainly you, 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 would expect, um, you would expect that to cover multiple functional regions, not, not just including the one that uh, does what you, what the function, you know, performs the function you're looking for. You know, I think uh, this, this will, uh, I'm sure, come up to later, maybe today, but certainly in, in subsequent sessions. I think what's, um, what's challenging um, about the, the last two points um, is that um, what they suggest is that the region that you're looking at um, uh, uh, is, is one of several uh, that's important for the task. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're seeing only that one area, um, showing the the, uh, the effect that you're looking for, it's um, what is tempted to rule out the other uh, the right. other alternatives, right? And say essentially right. this is the area and not others. And I think I think it's going to be important as we go along to make it clear why that reasoning fails. Right. Um, I mean the other the other possibility also is that the, uh, the the region that really does you know task X is uh, is just not frequently injured. Um, and your your area provides some sort of useful input to it that, that helps that that helps, um, but uh, you know maybe you only you only tend to see relatively mild or or, uh, or ephemeral uh, uh, injuries to the to singing processes because um, the areas that are frequently injured don't provide you know aren't the aren't the central critical area. Um, but yeah, there's a lot there's a lot more. I, I think uh, I have I have other slides about other issues with interpretation. We can talk more about that. Yeah, I, um, I think we're definitely going to come back to those. Um, I think we'll end up talking about that through, through, through all four of these sessions as well. Um, so, like I said, you know, there, hasn't, there hasn't been that much change in, in lesion behavior mapping over, over the past 150 years. Um, well, I guess at some point it became an experimental technique and not just, uh, you know, Paul Broca writing up a single subject. Um, but I, I want to describe what, what I think of as old school lesion behavior mapping, in other words, sort of the way it was done uh, when I was in grad school. Um, and I, I've sort of divided into, into four, four points that I, that I think uh, typify um, the way it used to be done. And uh, uh, a lot of these are, are still very viable um, approaches. I, I, would, I should say all of these are viable in, in some ways. Um, so the first is, is uh, course groupings of patients, um, by which I mean uh, instead of, instead of uh, looking at your patients at, on a voxel by voxel level, look at them as sort of maybe lobe by lobe or, or divide your patients into anterior patients with anterior damage and pa patients with posterior damage or left hemisphere and right hemisphere or whatever is of interest. Um, so these are, these are not voxel level analyses, these are, these are very large region level analyses. And essentially what, what's, what's going on when you do those kinds of analyses is you're, you're saying, I, want, I still want to do you know, something that's, that's image based, you're still, you're still basing it on some properties of, uh, some spatial properties of the, uh, of the brain, but you're choosing really, really large voxels. You know? Your whole brain is two voxels now, it's anterior and posterior, or something like that. Um, and you can you can you can chop it up as finely as you like. Um, you can go down to, to uh, broadness areas or other areas that you think are, are behaviorally relevant. And at some level, you get down to the level of voxels. Um, but uh, you know, certainly, if you if you don't have very good imaging, um, it, it's uh, or if you if you think that the the relevant level of damage is is at a higher spatial scale than individual voxels, it becomes much more practical to group patients uh, coarsely. Um, the other that, that's uh, similar in a way is discrete measures of performance. Um, when we do VLSM, as, as, you, as you'll see um, later, uh, we tend to look at, look at continuous behavioral measures, um, accuracy or error scores, things like that, um, if they're available, they aren't always. Um, and I think uh, traditionally, or at least more commonly in the past, uh, people have looked, at, um, have looked at discrete measures of performance as in you know, impaired or intact um, behaviorally. Uh, on some some behavior of interest, um, I wouldn't say that say that you know I, I, I'm not certainly claiming that continuous dependent ver measures are, are are an invention of the past uh, ten years, but um, I think to some extent discrete measures of performance with with no particular reason for um, 
for choosing a behavioral cutoff um, have, have gone out of fashion a little bit. Um, so these first, these first two, um, basically uh, turning either the lesion location or the, um, or the performance measure into, into a discrete binary or, or close measure, um, are forms of data reduction. Um, and especially in the case of, of looking at the brain image, they really are, are a matter of, uh, of sanity. Before we had uh, you know, computers to do brain imaging relatively quickly, um, you couldn't really do a voxel level analysis in, in, in your lifetime. Um, these other two, uh, two um, approaches that uh, I, I, it's a little unfair for me to call them old school because they really, they really, especially percent damage is still a very viable and useful technique. But um, instead of, instead of going, for, for example, if you're interested in a particular, you know, say area 44, um, instead of going from voxel to voxel and looking at the relationship between damage there and behavior in each voxel, um, it certainly makes some sense to look at, look at a measure of percent damage to the whole region. Um, and see how that relates to, to behavior. Perhaps the more damage you have to Area 44, the more difficulty you have with you know, producing verbs or whatever. Um, and while it's not always incredibly clear exactly what drives this you know, sort of continuous uh, relationship between percent damage and uh, behavior, it's certainly sensitive to, more, to, to a wider range of, uh, of relationships than, than just literally a, you know, a simple linear relationship between you know, amount of damage and uh, amount of dysfunction. Um, of course, percent damage is not the only way to summarize damage in an area, and it's, it's possible to use, um, to use different discrete cutoffs to try nonlinear functions and uh, other things. I don't think uh, it's been widely done, but um, if, if there's a reason to, it's certainly, certainly practical. Um, and finally, um, I think for, for, for relatively good reasons, uh, people in the past have, have often looked at um, overlap maps, basically taking a, taking a group of patients with some deficit um, and seeing where their lesions tend to overlap maximally. Um, it's, it's usually been done as a non-statistical statistical technique. There's, there's been some attempt to, to make it more of a statistical technique, but I don't think really very successfully. Um, and as you can see here, so Chris Rorden concocted this, um, this example to show exactly what's wrong with doing that in the, in the most naive way possible. Um, in the top, the top uh, slide, you can see, um, let's see, a map of, uh, I think it's 30, yeah, 36 patients with, um, with visual field defects. Um, in the middle, the middle, and you can see uh, where their where their maximum overlap is. It's in that green area, which is um, looks like it's uh, inferior parietal, heading into the temporal lobe somewhere. Um, it's not my favorite area of the brain, but anyway, uh, which seems like an unusual place to get visual field defects. Um, in the middle, but that's what you would that's what you would see if you were doing overlap mapping in the way it was done most often 20, 30 years ago. In the middle row, what you can see is the overlap map for patients without visual, deal defe visual field defects, which is in some ways the most natural control condition, uh, control group um, for this. And if you look at the subtraction map, you can see a much more sensible uh, take on where, um, where damage causes visual field defects. It's still not statistical, but at least the peak seems to be roughly in the right place. And what you discover by doing this is that what you were seeing in that first row is really a map of, of where the most frequently where the most frequently injured areas are in this, in this, in this population. So this sort of leads into what I think is a dominant approach to, to, to brain mapping these days, which is uh, the statistical parametric mapping approach. Um, SPM is, is, is both an approach called statistical parametric mapping, and it's also a software package by the same name. I'm going to use it mostly uh, to mean, to mean the, the approach, because um, I think it, it maps onto VLSM, even though the package doesn't do VLSM. Not exactly. Um, but it is worth, because we're going to be talking about this, this general approach a lot, it's worth sort of breaking down what, 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 uh, what all these words mean and why they're in there. Um, so the first, the, fir the, the S is for uh, statistical. Um, and I think, you know, as, as, as you can see with, with things like the overlap map, there, there, there have been non-statistical statistical techniques that have been productive but, but aren't exactly uh, ideal if you can do better. Um, and to be a little more specific, well, to be a little more specific, we, we're, we're looking at not just uh, any kind of statistics, but the SPM approach is, is, uses, by default, parametric statistics, um, which I'll, uh, I'll, I'll I have a slide about. I don't know how helpful the slide is. But you know, basically means doing, doing something like a t-test or something like a linear regression. Um, uh, a parametric statistic is, is basically one in which you, you coerce your, your results into, um, into something that, under null conditions, would conform to some known distribution, like the t-distribution. 
um, and then you uh, identify whether or not your, your observed values are, uh, appear to be extreme. So uh, SPM uh, goes toward, you know, is, uh, is geared towards parametric statistics, although there is an add-on for SPM uh, for non-parametric methods, um, and we actually use a lot of non-parametrics as well. So it's not really necessary, but it's stuck in the middle of the name anyway. Um, along with this, sort of mixed in with those two, is, is that we're mostly looking at linear relationships. Um, since I have a slide on that and a couple, couple more slides, I'll, I'll sort of um, skip over that for now. Um, but the final, the, the final two, uh, which, are, which are really two ways of looking at the same thing, are that SPM is voxel-based as opposed to ROI-based. It doesn't, doesn't have to be. There's, there, there's, there's no reason that, that the phrase SPM needs, needs, to, uh, needs to map at the voxel level, but that's, that's what people have, people have done. Um, and it's univariate in that we're considering each voxel independently. Um, this is really important because there are, you can imagine an approach where you don't necessarily need to look at, uh, at each voxel, you know, sort of through the, through, with blinders where you, where you actually look at the whole brain and look at the whole pattern of, uh, of damage to, uh, to best determine or best predict uh, what behavior is like. Uh, and SPM is not that. Um, so this is in some ways the most, the most, the most uh, central feature of SPM that's, uh, that's in many ways problematic is, is that it really looks at each voxel independently. Um, and so to summarize, um, this is, and this is what you do typically in, 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 uh, in fMRI and in VLSM, and it's conceptually very simple in that I was able to get it down to three lines, um, is that you create a statistical parametric map um, by fitting a linear model separately in each voxel um, to the data from that voxel, and testing the fit of that model using parametric statistics. And all the little, all the pieces, pieces here, you, you can, you can, you can fiddle with. You could say, well, let's change that and do, use non-parametric statistics, or let's do it separately in each ROI, or um, let's use a nonlinear model, um, or maybe not even a regression, regression model. Um, and these options are all, are all perfectly viable. The, the constraining factor is usually uh, what software is available. Um, and in some cases, whether or not the relative, uh, the relevant uh, theoretical background or theoretical groundwork has been carried out to, to apply the methods um, meaningfully. Behalf, on behalf of the, of the very uninitiated, uninitiated in the group, um, can we just clarify that when you use the word, um, uh, just the term voxel and, and ROI, so ROI, right, refers to region of interest, and when you use that, you're not, you're not characterizing the region in any, it, it could be a broad, a broad men's area, it could be an anatomically defined area, it could be big areas, small areas, it just means a region. When you refer to voxel, are you does it have a specific size, or no. are you just no? It no. So it also could be big or small. Yeah. So vo voxels, are, in in fMRI, they're usually defined by what's practical um, for 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 imaging. Um, but SPM actually, when you when you carry out an, an analysis in SPM, you start off with maybe three millimeter voxels, and then you know by the time you're doing the, the analysis, magically they've been resampled into two millimeter voxels. Um, in VLSM, we frequently do things at one millimeter, even though it's unlikely our actual resolution of meaningful differences is anywhere near that, that resolution. So the, what's characteristic of voxels is just that they're, they're, they sit on a regular grid. Um, but in, in many ways, they're, 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 no, they're no different from ROIs. They're, they just tend to be smaller. Um, yeah. Does anybody, I, I feel like uh, the, the level of interruptions has not been, has not been high enough. Um, <laughs> 